Good morning. Welcome to Burwood Church. Um, if you're visiting with us for the first time, it's uh, fantastic that you're here. And um, as we've just heard in the video clip, it's really important to be known. And uh, I'd like to invite you to make yourself known to us if you're a first timer or second timer. Uh, and we would love to get to know you in return. Uh, the water cooler is one of those metaphors that I think um, describes beautifully what the church itself should be. A place where people can hang out, where their guard comes down and where they share moments, um, those unguarded moments that perhaps uh, they wouldn't be prepared to share in any other environment. So I like to think of the church as kind of a, a water cooler, a place where people hang out, get to know each other and do life together. Um, it's a very powerful metaphor, but um, it's... Um, very specifically tied into Jesus's conversation with the woman at the well, and that's what we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks. Just invite you to bow your heads and pray with me before we begin. Gracious God, thank you so much that you have already made your presence uh, felt here today through the music and the words that have been spoken. I pray that as we reach back in time to to listen in on your profoundly personal and profoundly rich conversation with a Samaritan woman 2,000 years ago, that you will speak to us through that encounter. Challenge us, encourage us in our own spiritual journey over the next three weeks as we open our hearts and minds to receive whatever it is that the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. Amen. Amen. When I was growing up, one of the um, TV series that my family followed avidly was this program called Upstairs, Downstairs. I guess it's, uh, it was the equivalent of Downton Abbey today. It was set in a period of English history where class divisions were even more pronounced than they are today. It traced the fortunes of a very upper-class family who, of course, lived in the upstairs part of that house. And the interaction with other well-to-do families in that society. But the series was also tied very closely to the fortunes of those who worked in the downstairs part of the house, the servant class. Uh, there was a whole other world below the upstairs. And the interest um, of the series for people like us who tuned in from week to week was to observe the tension um, that existed between the two classes as these two worlds collided and interacted. They were, of course, mutually dependent upon one, uh, one another, and there was a lot of polite and courteous conversation between the upstairs people and the downstairs uh, people, but there was one thing that they could never be. They could never be friends. Because there was always this reminder of the gap between the two whenever the bell was rung. Every time that bell rang, it was a reminder to those beneath that their lives were not their own. It was a reminder of the distance between the upstairs and the downstairs. It was a reminder of all the things they could never have and never become. And I wonder if we still play upstairs, downstairs today in our relationships with others. Students, when you're choosing teams at school and you get a chance to be the captain and you get to choose your team, um, do you always pick people um, based on um, whether you like them or you think um, they add value to you and your team in some way? They're always the ones who get picked first. There are others, of course, that you would just rather never have to pick unless you're directed to by the teacher. You would just rather not have them on your team full stop. At the office, are there some people that you just don't have time for? People whose cubicles or rooms you just pass on by because it's too uncomfortable to engage in any form of conversation with them. You know, all too often, either consciously or unconsciously, we separate the people that we meet into upstairs and downstairs people. Those that we consider worthy of our time and admiration and others who we'd rather just avoid because we view them as weird, different, or if we're ruthlessly honest, they just don't add much value to my life. 
Somebody once said very wisely that you can measure the true worth of a person by how they treat those who can be of no real value to them. <coughs> how true. And it was this kind of deeply divided society into which Jesus was born. The Jews might have been unified in their hatred and dislike of Rome, but that's about where any form of unity began and ended for them. There were so many factions in Jewish society, so much racial hatred directed at each other, so many different views about what needed to happen if the, um, in the future if the nation was ever to be set free and to prosper again. They were deeply divided theologically as well, as there was much debate about how and when and who the Messiah was going to be and what the shape and the nature of this kingdom that he was supposed to bring along with him and establish, what that was actually going to look like. Gender inequality was off the scale in Jesus' time, and we'll look at that in just a moment. There was one more thing that Jerusalem Jews in particular were agreed on, and that was in their mutual hatred of Samaritans. Samaritans were located very firmly on the bottom rungs of the social ladder. They were down there with tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners. Samaritans were universally loathed and despised by the so-called pure-blood Jews. And there were two reasons for this. Um, you know, we've heard for years about the story of the Good Samaritan and how much the Samaritans were hated and so on. But perhaps um, you've never been told why or you've never taken the time to explore why. Well, there were two reasons why the Samaritans were so despised. Um, when the Kingdom of Israel had separated into two distinct kingdoms, you'll remember this happened after the reign of Solomon, that um, there was a, an agonizing split um, between uh, the Northern Kingdom and uh, the southern kingdom. And uh, when the kingdom of Israel had separated into these two, the two distinct kingdoms, Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, uh, Israel, that was its name, the northern kingdom was called Israel. Um, Samaria, the capital of it, was the very first one to apostatize. And what I mean by that, within a very short time of the separation of the kingdoms, idols started appearing on the streets of Samaria, the capital city. And it was all downhill for Israel from that point onwards, and we know what happened to them. Um, those who remained faithful to God in the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom, you'll remember, lasted a lot longer than the northern kingdom did before it too went into exile. But those in the south who had remained faithful to God, they learned to despise people from Samaria as a result of um, the fact that that city apostatized before any other. So they were always from that time, the Samarians looked down upon as second class citizens. But they were also hated for another reason, and that is because they were considered to be half-breeds, not true blood um, Jews. The reason for this is that when the Assyrian Empire which, uh, as you can see, is uh, in the light purple at the top of the screen there. When the Assyrian Empire um, conquered Israel and took the Israelites into captivity, in a move to try and dilute the influence of Jewish culture in the region, Jewish men and women were forced to intermarry with Assyrian men and women. And over time, this changed the cultural composition of those in captivity, such that when they were freed Finally, to return to their homeland many, many, many years later, they came back very different people to the ones they were when they had left. A lot of the cultural traditions and values had been lost. And this was a, an intentional strategy on the part of the Assyrians. They did this to every single nation that they conquered. Um, they ensured by intermarrying that it diluted um, the influence of the culture of the country that they had just conquered uh, on the region. Um, and it ensured that that country would never pose any kind of military threat to it in the future because all their children were half Assyrian, so you wouldn't attack the mother country and so on. So it was a very clever strategy on the part of the Assyrians, but it led to this poor half-breed race, um, half Jew, half Assyrian, uh, and the pure-blood Jews always looked down on these half-breeds with derision 
as a result. So those are the two reasons why the Samaritans were hated so much. The only thing worse than stooping to converse with a Samaritan would be stooping to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman, particularly one with a checkered past that kind of ostracised her from the community that she belonged to. Now, the radical nature of Jesus' decision to converse with this woman at the well can only be fully appreciated when we look at the way in which women in Jesus' day were oppressed and dehumanised. I'm just going to race through some of these um, just to give you a, a taste of just how um, uh, unbelievably um, evil the kinds of attitudes that existed in those days um, towards women and the way in which they were despicably treated. Uh, for example, some of these are long, um, so I'll just gloss through them very quickly, just dot point them. Uh, these are all taken from a variety of historical sources that, um, uh, that I came upon as I was uh, reading for this, for this message. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, there was a huge shortage of women. There was about 140 men for every 100. Well, what happened to the other women? Well, they were just simply left to die. There was no obligation on any family to have more than one daughter. If you had a daughter, yes, you had to keep her, you couldn't discard her, but any girl born after that, uh, you had every legitimate right to just abandon them and let them die. Uh, in the city of Delphi, for example, uh, out of 600 known families there that archaeology has turned over, only six of them raised more than one daughter. The rest were apparently abandoned to die. Uh, other attitudes like these ones. No woman was allowed to study, study the Torah. Um, one rabbi put it this way, rather that the words of the Torah be burned than entrusted to a woman. Um, the status of uh, Roman women was also very low. Uh, Roman law placed a wife under the absolute control of her husband and he could divorce her if she went out in public without a veil, something as trivial as that. Uh, as was the case with um, the Greek women and their culture, women were not allowed to speak in public. Um, just as an interesting aside to that, um, the plays that were performed at that time, um, the female characters were either played by young boys whose voices hadn't broken yet, or they were played by prostitutes, women of the night, who were, uh, you know, it was kind of accepted for them to be out at night time, whereas um, good, proper women were never, on, never seen in public. They were never on the streets. Uh, very, very bizarre kinds of um, rules and regulations that we would laugh at in our day. In the ancient world, a woman's highest calling uh, was to bear children, was another statement I came across. In Rome, a widow was fined if she didn't marry within two years. It was considered bad form to outlive your husband and you were a drag on the economy if you didn't marry again. This is one of my personal favourites. He who walks with a woman in public brings evil upon himself. One is not so much as to even greet a woman. Funny, this one. There was one group of rabbis called the bruised and bleeding rabbis who committed themselves to never even look at a woman. They figured that that was the best way to deal with lust. If they thought they saw a woman out of the corner of their eye, they would close their eyes until they were sure she was out of sight. The problem is that this caused them to be forever running into objects and buildings, and hence the title, the bruised and bleeding rabbis. I kid you not, that is actually historical. And finally, one that I'm sure that we're all uh, familiar with, uh, women's uh, testimony was not admissible evidence in court. So that just gives you a taste of the despicable way in which women were treated and abused uh, in Jesus' time. And this was just considered normal. Uh, nobody challenged that until Jesus. Jesus chose to blindside everyone by showing up in the most unlikely place at the most unlikely time and turn a Samaritan woman's world upside down. He meets her at a well, as we said earlier, the ancient world equivalent of the water cooler. A very public, very common, actually very banal kind of place to meet one another and have a private conversation. The last kind of place that you would actually expect God to show up. I like to think of the well, therefore, as a symbol of the very ordinary places in our lives where God shows up and connects with us 
At times, perhaps, when we expected him least, there he is. As I said before, too, the water cooler is a place where people's defences come down and moments of unguarded honesty are shared, as always seems to happen in the presence of food and drink. It's here in these unguarded moments that we can often reveal things about ourselves that we wouldn't have done in any other environment. And in this frank and surprisingly intimate conversation recorded in John chapter 4 that we're going to unpack over the next three weeks, Jesus changes not just one life, but an entire town. Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you please give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Like, duh, don't you get it? How can you ask me for a drink? In brackets, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. The reasons I gave earlier. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. We don't usually read it that way, do we? He would have given you living water. How about if we changed it? He would have given you living water much more meaningful. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The value of this conversation for us is that Jesus uses it as an opportunity to answer some profoundly important questions that while may not have been articulated aloud, um, become um, answers that should dictate not only how we should live our individual lives, but I think also how we should conduct ourselves as a church. And the first unspoken question that emerges from this interview, and there's going to be a couple of others that um, Anthony and Moy will look at in the coming weeks, but the first um, question that uh, I think Jesus deals with in this conversation is the one that I'll be focusing on today, and that's this question. Who matters to God? Who's in and who's out? In this encounter with a, we'd have to say, a fairly unremarkable Samaritan woman, the disciples got to see Jesus answer that question in a way they had never anticipated. Jesus' message to the woman is this, you are loved. You are somebody. You are a treasured child of the Most High God. And I want to fill you and move you forward to a place where you can truly live truly be free from everything that's taking you down right now and in the future. That is the spirit that Jesus asks of his church as well. To go into the world with that as the starting point to every conversation we have with everyone we meet. We need to answer that question, who's in, with a resounding And I'm going to hark back to a couple of weeks ago when we introduced our theme for the whole year, All In. We we need to respond to that question, who's in, with a resounding all in. We're all in if we choose to be. Because everyone matters. There's room for everyone and no one need be left behind. There was a a really beautiful story um, in the news that I came across just recently um, about this happened in England um, where the police, 999 is the emergency uh, uh, number to call over there, and um, police got the idea that uh, a woman was in trouble and so they went around to, uh, they responded to the call 
And what they discovered was that there was no real medical emergency there at all. An elderly couple had just rung 999 because they felt so desperately lonely. So they discovered that this couple had made the phone call out of desperation. Um, the 95-year-old wife was caring for her husband who was blind and she um, just felt that she had come to the end of her um, you know, ability to, to care and she just needed somebody to talk to, uh, somebody to, to process through what she was feeling. So this uh, um, constable, police constable, said that... Um, uh, he could do nothing else but just um, brew them a cup of tea, which he did, and he sat down and he just talked with them um, and did nothing else other than that, but uh, the, uh, the two elderly people were just so incredibly grateful and it just made their day. Um, and it just reminded me of the fact that uh, it can be so simple in ministering to the needs of the world. You know, we don't have to do grand things necessarily that cost lots and lots of money and lots and lots of our time either. It's the simple things where we just connect with people and connect them into a sense of community. This is what Jesus was doing with the woman at the well. Just interestingly, in England, 51% of all people over 75 live alone. Five million people say that television is their main form of company. Another statistic, over one million older people there say that they have not spoken to a friend, a neighbour or a family member for at least a month. Very, very sad statistics, but it's great to know that there are people like this young policeman out there who are willing to just do the simple things, what it takes to bring another person back into community and connect them in again. When Jesus came to earth, his purpose was to bring up there down here, to bring upstairs, downstairs, and make them one. As we've seen previously, Jesus declared at the beginning of his ministry that uh, he had come to be the kingdom bringer. This harks back to a message I took some months ago. And we've seen, if you remember that uh, occasion, that there were big questions in Jesus' day about how the kingdom was going to come. There were big fights between the factional groups, such as the Zealots, the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They all had their own take on how things were going to play out. Two things um, everybody agreed on, though, uh, Jesus' disciples as well. Everybody agreed that the coming of the kingdom was all about Israel becoming great again, becoming established as a, um, a powerful nation. And secondly, everyone was agreed on who the kingdom was going to be good news for. It was going to be good news for true Israelites, pure blood Jews. That's who the kingdom was coming for. But then Jesus came and his message was this. Hey, the kingdom is right here in me. This is it, my body my life, my way of being with people, my understanding of the Father, what I teach, my death on the cross for your sins, my resurrection that's going to take care of the death problem. The kingdom of God is coming through me. But Jesus had even harder news for the Israelites to swallow when he went on to teach about what type of people were invited to live in this kind of brand new kingdom. And one day he drops a bombshell this is in Mark chapter 4. When evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Now that's the bomb right there. That phrase, the other side. We tend to gloss over this, but in Jesus' day, the other side of the lake was actually kind of a technical term, the other side. He's not just talking here about a geographical location. The other side of the lake was used in his day to refer to this region here. Oh, I got to... um, this region here. Uh, crossing the lake from this side, which was the Jewish side, over here to the Decapolis. The word Decapolis is a Greek word. Um, you would know that Deca means 10. So Decapolis is a Greek word that means 10 cities. 
And those cities in black there are the 10 cities that made up this region called the Decapolis. And this was enemy territory. These were pagan people. Back when Israel was first occupying the Holy Land, there had been this promise made in Joshua chapter 3. Sorry, slides are a little bit out of order. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, uh, the Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Arnorites, and Jebusites. Maybe we should add to that the insecticides. And... But every, every site is there. Uh, these were known as the seven nations of Canaan. And they were talked about even in Jesus' day. In Acts chapter 13, for example... We have this, sent, uh, this text. God overthrew the seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as an inheritance. And so the Decapolis, uh, the area there with all of the cities uh, in bold black, that's where the seven nations of Canaan settled when they got kicked out of the left-hand side there, the, to the left of the Sea of Galilee. That was um, the land occupied by Israel. So where did the Canaanites who were living there originally go? Over to the other side, as you can see um, illustrated in that map. Had to go somewhere, and that's where they were, on the other side of the lake. The Decapolis was filled with pagan temples, and archaeology is uncovering more and more of these every day. Um, they featured cults that exalted sexuality and violence and wealth. This area was everything that Israel was not. The Jews regarded the other side as the place where Satan lived. It was dark. It was evil. It was oppressive. It was demonic. Nobody goes to the other side. Especially no rabbi ever goes to the other side. You get a feel for this um, if you remember Jesus' visit to the other side. One of the first things that he encounters is a demon-possessed man. The second thing he encounters is someone farming pigs. The disciples knew they weren't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and so when Jesus said, hey guys, let's go over to the other side, no doubt the disciples were thinking, what is he doing? Doesn't he know that the kingdom is for our side? It's almost like he doesn't know that this is the other side. It's almost like he thinks it's his side. It's almost like he thinks every side belongs to him. It's almost like he thinks that all the peoples of the earth are going to be blessed now through him, even the seven nations of Canaan. The first time they went over to the other side, Everybody begged him to leave, except for one pathetic demon-possessed man who Jesus healed. Strangely enough, the second time Jesus comes back to the other side, it's one of the most amazing dramatic responses in all of the New Testament. Now the people in the Decapolis are more receptive to Jesus than almost any other place ever was that Jesus visited. Great crowds now come to see him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the dumb, and many others, all laid at his feet, and he healed them all. The people were amazed when they saw, and um, they saw that uh, even though they were people on the other side, God had come to visit them. And here were all of these Canaanites living in the Decapolis, now praising the God of Israel, the seven nations of Canaan bowing down before the Jewish God. What happened? What changed? The influence of one man. A healed, demon-possessed man went around the Decapolis telling his story. That's all he did. And there's a beautiful parallel in the story with that of the woman at the well as uh, also where they go back and they tell their story and in the process they save many people, save their town.
This is um, the text that reminds us uh, of the power of one life, the power of one. The man began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Like the woman at the well, one guy told the story of what Jesus did for him and it changed everything. It changed whole cities. It changed the spiritual climate of the other side. You know, it's kind of funny. A lot of times people love to argue about religion or about uh, different theological issues. Um, One thing it's really hard to argue with is someone's personal story. Just to go up to somebody and say, hey, can I tell you my story? Can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you about the difference that he's made in my life? It's interesting that there's a way in which that one man could reach people here that even Jesus and his disciples could not reach because this man was one of them. He was one of the people. And so um, they were prepared to listen to him in a way that they wouldn't have been willing to listen to the disciples. People will listen to somebody who is one of them. And that's why perhaps it's only you rather than me, that can reach people in your workplace. Um, People accept you as one of them, and you have a very powerful position for influence. Jesus wanted to teach his disciples something on this second visit to the other side. He wanted to let them know that good news was coming, but it was coming for everyone. And he wants to make sure his disciples get it, so he does another miracle. In Mark 8, when Jesus has returned... He's he's on the other side and he's teaching. And by now there's a crowd of 4,000 people that have gathered to listen to him. 4,000 Canaanites. Jesus says to his disciples, I have compassion for these people. Um, They have already been with me three days and they've had nothing to eat. So I'm going to step back for a moment. You might remember in Mark chapter 6 that on the Jewish side of the lake, Jesus performs a miracle there, a very similar miracle to the one he's about to perform on the other side, where he fed 5,000 people. And um, you'll remember that uh, at that time, the number of baskets of food that were collected by way of leftovers was 12. 12 baskets of leftovers were collected. See, in that number 12, Jesus was sending a signal Everybody understood the significance of the number 12 because it represented Israel. And in the 12 baskets of leftovers, Jesus was saying, hey, God remembers his people. God remembers you, 12 tribes of Israel. God is providing for his people. God cares about his people. That was Mark chapter 6. Now we come forward two chapters. Jesus is on the other side of the lake. Uh, And this time it's kind of interesting. He waits three days before he suggests that it's time to feed the people. Uh, Last time he just taught for one day um, before he said to the disciples, hey, we've got to take care of these people. They're hungry. They've got to be fed. This time um, his disciples don't say anything. He teaches one day, they don't say anything. He teaches a second day, they don't say anything. He teaches a third day, his disciples still don't say anything about the need to feed this crowd. Why not? Well, because they're on the other side. It's not our job to feed them. We feed people on our side. It's not our job to feed people on the other side. But Jesus' response is this one. I have compassion for these people. I want to take care of them. I want to feed them. And he miraculously does feed them, just like he miraculously fed people on the other side, on the Israel side. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, uh, the disciples picked up. Can anyone tell me how many baskets of leftovers there were this time? How many baskets of leftovers? Seven. Seven. Seven, 12 the first time, seven this time. Well, how come only seven this time? Anyone want to guess why? How many nations of Canaan were there that the Jews believed um, were on the other side in, in Decapolis? How many nations of Canaan? Seven, exactly right. Jesus is saying, you know what? 
The good news is coming for the 12 tribes. I haven't forgotten them. They're mine. I'm going to feed them and I'm going to take care of them. 12 basketfuls of leftovers remind them symbolically of that. But the good news is also that I'm coming for the seven nations of Canaan. I haven't forgotten them either. They are mine too. I will feed them too. Twelve tribes, seven nations, really, it doesn't matter to me. I love them all, is what he's saying symbolically through these stories. And so the first lesson we take away from the encounter at the water cooler is the reminder that the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is good news for everybody. It's good news for this side and it's good news for the other side because it's like every side is his side. But friends, Jesus was very clear on two things. Two things would keep his followers from going over to the other side. What is the other side for you? Is it that colleague that you've never dared to talk about Jesus to? Um, Is it people who seem far from God and they're just scary and so you don't go over to their other side to talk to them and just tell them your story? Jesus said that the first of two things that would prevent his followers from doing that would be fear. It's no accident that on each of their two trips over to the Decapolis, the disciples experienced a storm. Jesus was forcing them to confront their fears before they arrived there, before going into enemy territory. These were foreign places they were being called to go to outside of their comfort zone. They heard Jesus tell that story and he told it on the wrong side and they watched him get killed for it. They needed to know that Jesus was greater than their fears, that he was ultimately in control, that even the wind and the waves obeyed them. And I think that's why on their trips over to the Decapolis, each time they were confronted with a violent storm, it gave Jesus an opportunity to say, I'm in control. Because he wanted to say to them, When you conquer your fear, everything becomes possible to you. The second thing that prevents people sharing the love of God is just simply prejudice. Thinking that there's upstairs people and there's downstairs people in this life. That God kind of looks at us more favorably because we dress and speak better than some other people. Prejudice is an obstacle we must all overcome if we are to become kingdom bringers. Yes. As individuals, as a church, um, never let us think more highly of ourselves than we should. Mm. Remembering that only Jesus knows who his church really is because only Jesus can read hearts. Right. It is our task to invite people into a kingdom where no one is left out, where everyone is included, a kingdom where everyone matters to Jesus, the same Jesus who said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, go, go to the other side and tell your story. Make followers of me out of all the peoples. Be a blessing to all the nations of the earth and I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen.